All right, so up next, um, you already heard it mentioned in the, in the presentation that just ended, but now we're going to move to a presentation on the Sinopia Link Data Editor by Jeremy Nelson uh, from Stanford University. Uh, Jeremy, you should be able to share your screen and uh, show us your presentation. All right, thank you very much, Huda, and everyone who's attending the session. Uh, my name is Jeremy Nelson, and I'm a software engineer at Stanford University Libraries. I've been involved uh, with the Sinopia project uh, pretty much since its inception. And what I'll do today is give you a quick background on uh, the progress of, of the project, and then I'll go into some of the more details of the technology we've used to implement uh, the Sinopia stack, and then some workflows and then finally, I'll end up talking about uh, in this latest uh, work cycle that we just finished up this past uh, past year on our new API, and then I'll, there'll be a final like links to, 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 to link out to this. Now, first off, uh, this presentation is available at the link here, at https forward slash ld4p github.io uh, swib-2020. And uh, I'll just go ahead and, and start with the background. So uh, the Sinopia and the LD4P, we're actually in our third uh, grant uh, cycle from the A Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And uh, we're currently on version 3.56. And the software development for the, the Sinopia stack, which includes the editor, uh, was, was developed primarily by uh, Stanford University Libraries with, with definite help from actually Huda uh, and, and other people involved in the project. In the first work cycle, which started in 2018 and went through to 2019, uh, the Sinopia editor was initially a fork of the first Library of Congress boot frame editor code base. The, the editor itself was heavily refactored and using uh, the front end JavaScript React framework, which is uh, composed of web based components. And then we also used uh, a JavaScript Redux uh, open source library for doing basically state management, sort of knowing what's happening within the editor at any single point. Uh, the back end RDF manage management was initially accomplished using Trellis, which is a linked data platform. Uh, and we also had a supporting Elasticsearch search index, which, you, which you'll be able to see and we still use to enable sort of finding, finding resources and templates within the editor itself. Our, uh, Sinopia, our entire Sinopia stack is deployed on Amazon Web Services, and I'll be showing you uh, next sort of the current architecture of how we're deploying and using AWS to, to provide Sinopia to, to the different institutions and catalogers. In work cycle two, which was primarily in 2019, we actually saw the first production use of Snopia to create RDF descriptions by 22 cohort institutions. Um, many of these institutions were involved with different original cataloging projects, projects that use Snopia in their own work. Uh, on the development side of things, user interface improvements was a, was a big focus in that second work cycle. And also figuring out different ways we could improve the JSON-based resource templates. And I just mentioned in work cycle three, three which just finished up uh, in September, uh, we actually migrated off of Trellis in favor of AWS Document DB, which is a MongoDB uh, version that's, that Amazon provides uh, in their web services. And another major change, which uh, Paloma mentioned in the previous uh, pres presentation, was that we moved from these JSON-based resource templates to use RDF-based templates. And then we also depreciated uh, the dedicated profile editor application that was originally forked from the Library of Congress. And we also, as, as a big focus, created an API that provided CRUD, so create, read, update, delete operations, along with user customizations and big frame specific enhancements within the editor itself. So our current architecture, um, and this is, I mentioned before, has evolved over the three different work cycles. But at its broadest level is a client-side React single page application. And you can see this over here on the left. 
Uh, it connects to a server-side API, and both of these are run as Node.js applications on AWS. We also have three server-side helper applications. One is a new Lambda, AWS Lambda, that converts uh, RD, uh, RDF to Mark. Now, granted that RDF is restricted to just bid frame entities at this time. We also have an export uh, service that exports the RDF to be downloaded uh, by users. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, we have a uh, indexing application that that uh, listens to changes that occur in the document DB and then index into our Elasticsearch index. Another important piece is our questioning authority service and partnership. And within the QA and their infrastructure, it's not run on AWS, but it, it has a Lucene index and also use Fizeki as a triple store to support that. So next, I'm going to be talking about the actual RDF templates and kind of show you what that looks like. So I'm uh, in the RDF templates. It's really, I think, a, a testament to the flexibility of RDF that we we're able to represent a meta layer for describing resources in Synopia, which means that the catalogers can use the same user interface for both RDF templates and then using those templates to catalog resources with those templates. Now, uh, initially, and I, I, I mentioned it in the previous slide, that uh, the Library of Congress's the original uh, bid frame editor used a JSON-based domain-specific language, or DSL. And, but the problem was that that required a separate editor to run. And it was also, uh, when we did the fork, was using an old version of the Angular JavaScript framework. As we progressed through the different work cycles and as Synopia matured, we realized we needed more functionality from the, from the templates. And so we explored and then implemented a RDF template vocabulary. And there's a link there to Synopia.io vocabulary, which you can actually see our RDF vocabulary that we're using to describe and create RDF resources within, within Synopia. So here, I'm going to actually go into the Synopia link data, data at itself at Synopia.io. So I'm logged in, and I'll just bring you, a, a show you an example. So for here, for a monograph instance, I'm actually going to show you the, and edit the template itself. So here's the template, and Paloma sort of showed you the major sections of this. But here is the template itself and the different properties. Um, you, and then you can associate and create and add to or edit uh, uh, resources to or the templates to actually describe a resource that you might be interested in. You can always see, of course, what this looks like in RDF. So here is the you can see a pretty involved and long template to describe uh, monograph instances within Synopia. Now, uh, so this is actually just a template. If I go back to the resource templates. And then I want to actually create a instance using that template. I can just click on that, and this will bring me into a, 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 a yes, sir. there we go. And you can see here this is the actual uh, resource that, if I wanted to, I can go in through and then add and edit and do lookups and all the things that uh, are required by catalogers who are actually cataloging natively in linked data. Um, so here's I, I, in the presentation I hear I actual actual actually provided a, a, a couple of screenshots and I just want to emphasize that although we have sort of optimized for bid frame you can use other vocabularies and here's an example of using the schema.org book uh, vocabulary to create both a template and then a resource based on that so I've already showed you a couple of examples in the actual editor itself um, Again, uh, it was uh, designed to be a generic or general linked data editor, but over time, uh, particularly given the requirements, uh, that we've sort of focused on optimizing, particularly for bib frames. So although we are uh, allow other vocabularies, bib frame is our, our primary focus uh, for developing features. Um, 
Now, uh, the, the previous, both Nancy and, and Paloma, talked about the RDF templates developed by BCC for bid frame works, instances, and items, along with their subclasses. And so uh, catalogers can describe the resource, and then they can mint URIs for these classes and link them through the Synopia interface. Uh, so also, I think it should be mentioned that depending on how these RDF template, the creator structured the, their, the template that they created, Synopia can allow users to link to external entities and, in, in, and construct a, a triple using the external lookup resource called Questioning Authority or directly for some of the vocabularies from the Library of Congress. So here, I just want to show you an example of uh, a, a particular workflow. So if a cataloger is interested in actually creating an instance uh, monograph work and a item, so let that load up. You can actually load these as separate uh, tabs within the editor itself. So let me bring up one more item. That's what I was looking for. So here, uh, the cataloger can go back and forth uh, between these different tabs to be able to actually enter in information. And let me go, let's see, place of work. I think we look up here. So here, if I wanted to go look at Palo Alto, you can see actually a live search being, uh, being going both, both the Library of Congress geographic names as well as the GeoNames uh, Authority resource. So if I wanted to, I could look and I say, okay, some of these may or may not be what I'm looking for. Or if I want to use the Library of Congress, um, and I want to say, okay, East Palo Alto. So then we actually create a triple. And if we actually, if we go back and do a preview, you can see where we have uh, recorded the, the the actual URI. And as sort of a convenience function, we also capture the label that is coming back from the uh, uh, resource or the uh, questioning authority resource. So here is just a small example of where we have the work. Now I can also connect this work to, so you can see here, if I wanted to say, okay, has bid print instance, I can search Synopia itself. And so if I say, um, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't think, I, okay. I can also copy or find a, a, a URI that I may have generated and saved here within the uh, monograph instance on un, nested template. So the, this is really, again, uh, Sinopia, we've been really trying to uh, trying to uh, use a lean, uh, agile process where the requirements of the catalogers and the institutions using Sinopia really drive the features and how we how we structure the the Sinopia editor itself. Uh, a couple of other sort of features that we have within the editor, uh, you can do a Sorry, just to, just to say two minutes left, sorry. No, two minutes for okay. So I'll actually just really briefly, I wanted to talk about our new API, which I think is uh, pretty important. So uh, by we have now a new API that, that is publicly available that allows you to query the API to extract resources based on what group or institution it was saved to, as well as the type. We also... Uh, 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 because of the API allows us to actually start investigating and thinking about maybe using machine learning to sort of improve some of the workflow flows to really streamline that and make it easier for the cataloger to use. Now, uh, we another important piece of this is why we migrated from Trellis is that uh, Trellis itself is uh, wasn't a very popular or it's not a very popular project and we we're having some issues both with scalability and reliability using Trellis on AWS. And then um, trying having to support uh, and, and looking towards more personalization and functions within Synopia. And you can see that with our new dashboard, we actually are now saving uh, the recent resources, searches and, and um, templates that were used so that uh, again, improving the experience and workflows for the user. So finally, um, thank you. I would encourage anyone who's interested to please go to stage.synopia.io and create an account if you want to experiment with using Synopia. Uh, there's also on the API, there's a link to, we have an, have an open API 
a specification. So if you wanted to direct interact with the Synopia templates and resources that are structured in RDF, you can do that. And um, I also linked here a couple of the links and, and resources uh, that were, were mentioned in this uh, presentation. So thank you again for having, a, having me, and um, I look forward to hearing your, your questions. And I also linked here to my email address if you want to email me any questions you may have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so uh, over to Julia, who already has a question for us. Uh, yes, there was one question, but I think you just answered it in the end um, about the uh, editor itself. Is it free to use? But you said you can just create an account and you can just go ahead, if I understood correctly, yes? Yes, absolutely. And I will also say that all of our code is uh, open source and licensed under the Apache 2 uh, uh, software license. So you are also more than welcome to download and, and run Synopia locally. Uh, we found that the easiest way to do that is actually using Docker containers. And that's sort of documented in the README in the Synopia editor uh, repository code base. Okay. And we had some other question coming up now. Um, how does the template ontology compare to Shackle or Shex? Um, so certainly, again, uh, that's something that, that uh, we can look at, at doing um, in future work cycles. Again, uh, the priorities of, of what, is the, uh, what is requested from Snopia comes from our users. So if that becomes a priority, then that would, that, that would be something we would address in, in a subsequent work cycle. OK, this was actually a question that was asked again, like shortly after that also for validation. But I think that was the question so far. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all.